Uh, I'm here today to talk in support of the Gregg Amendment. I rise in support of my colleague from New Hampshire's amendment because it would prohibit using Medicare cuts in the Democratic health care bill to pay for new government spending. It's interesting as you listen to the debate. Uh, in fact, I was interested to hear my colleague from North Dakota say that the Republican amendments would increase the deficit. Well, they would only increase the deficit if you assume all of the spending in the bill that is also opposed by the Republicans. And uh, one of the key parts of the debate that I think needs to be emphasized here is uh, among all the other things that this bill does, when you have the first full 10 years of real implementation of the bill, it's a two and a half trillion dollar increase in federal spending, paid for with hundreds of billions of dollars, in fact trillions of dollars, of new taxes and cuts in Medicare. And the purpose of, excuse me, let's go to this chart right here. The purpose of the Gregg Amendment is to require that when we <clears throat> do achieve savings in Medicare, that instead of being used to just transfer into a new government entitlement program, making Medicare less solvent, we instead use those savings for Medicare itself. In the first 10 years of the bill, we'll see cuts in Medicare by $465 billion, every dollar of which will be simply be transferred over to a massive new federal entitlement program. If you actually take the first 10 full years of the implementation of the bill, and recall that there's some budget gimmicks being played here in order to say that it's not a, generating a deficit, and uh, it's not really implemented fully until about four years into the bill. If you actually take the first 10 years of implementation, the cuts to Medicare are not $465 billion, but a trillion dollars, and three trillion dollars over a longer period of time as we evaluate the bill moving out into the future. In, Medica in the Medicare Hospital Insurance Trust Fund, annual outlays already exceed the annual income. So the fund is drawing down on its holdings to pay for full benefits. But not for long. By the year 2017, the, healthcare, the, the HI Trust Fund will be insolvent and will no longer be able to pay full benefits for seniors. And these cuts are going to make it worse. This amendment provides that the major provisions in the underlying bill, including the subsidies and the Medicaid expansion, cannot go into effect unless the Director of the Office of Management and Budget and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services certify that all of the projected spending in the bill is offset with savings, but that savings shall exclude any changes to Medicare or Social Security. In other words, we require that Medicare savings be used for Medicare and Social Security savings be used for Social Security. This will ensure that the savings generated from the Medicare cuts in the bill do not go toward the creation of a brand new entitlement program at the expense of our seniors. If the non-Medicare savings don't offset the new costs, then the Secretary of the Treasury and the Secretary of HHS are prohibited from implementing new spending or revenue reduction provisions in the bill. Republicans have opposed the Reed bill's harmful cuts to Medicare through three votes. Should those cuts remain, the Gregg Amendment makes sure that Medicare savings go to making the program more solvent, not to offset the new entitlement program. Congress should not raid Medicare, a program that has, raised, that has $38 trillion in unfunded liabilities, and use it as a piggyback to pay for the new programs. The government already has $70 trillion in unfunded obligations over the next 75 years, and we should not add to it with these dangerous provisions. This $70 trillion in unfunded obligation represents a burden of $600,000 per American household. And the Reed bill carries an estimated cost, as I said earlier, of $2.5 trillion over the first 10 years that it's fully implemented. But it's fully loaded also with budget gimmicks. Earlier in this debate, we voted 100 to 0 for the Bennett Amendment, a rule of construction which stated that nothing in the bill shall result in the reduction of guaranteed Medicare benefits. In contrast with the Bennett Amendment, the Gregg Amendment actually guarantees that there will be for future generations Medicare, while guarding against the creation of a new unfunded entitlement that this country can't afford. Now, Mr. P Madam President, with the remaining time that I have, I'd like to respond a little bit to uh, some of the arguments that uh, my colleague from North Dakota just made. Uh, I just mentioned that we've had three votes already to try to take these Medicare cuts out of the bill. All of those votes have failed. 
And the senator from North Dakota indicated that those votes would have reduced the deficit, have, would have caused a, a, a huge deficit problem. Well, that's true if you assume the $2.5 trillion of spending in the bill will continue. But those who claim that there is a, a reduction in the deficit in this bill can do so only if they assume three things. One, if they assume the budget gimmicks are implemented. And by that, I mean they haven't included the SGR payments for physicians, a $245 billion cost over the next 10 years. It's just not there, not in the bill, because it can't be accounted for. Secondly, they've delayed the cost implementation portions of the bill by four years now so that they have 10 years of revenue and four years of spending so that they can claim that it balances. And even then, they cannot claim that this bill helps the deficit unless they assume the hundreds of billions of dollars of new taxes and the hundreds of billions of dollars of cuts in Medicare. If any one of those items were taken out, the Medicare cuts, the tax increases, or the budget gimmicks, this bill is shown to be what it is, a huge, huge expansion of the federal government that is going to necessitate increased tax burdens and reductions in spending, as well as budget gimmicks to hide what can't be hidden in order to claim that it does not generate a deficit. I think most Americans understand that those kinds of gimmicks are the kinds that we see all the time in Congress when we're trying to make it look like we aren't engaging in debt spending and in increasing the national debt. The bottom line here is that, it's, that there is a significant amount of reform that can be achieved that can reduce the cost of health care, that can reduce the cost of health insurance premiums that we could agree to on a bipartisan basis. If we were not stuck in this debate on the insistence that we create a massive new intrusion of the federal government into control and operation of the health care economy and development of yet again another massive new federal entitlement program at the expense of some of the current entitlement programs. I haven't even talked about what's being done in Medicaid yet. I'm sure that other speakers are going to talk about that. Madam President, this bill as I said, will increase spending and the size of the government by two and a half trillion dollars. It will cut Medicare benefits over that same true full period by a trillion dollars. It will increase taxes by hundreds of billions of dollars and over that, sec that true full 10 year period of implementation over a trillion dollars. It will force the neediest of our uninsured in this country not into the opportunity to gain insurance coverage, but into another failing program, a failing federal entitlement program, Medicaid. It will drive a massive unfunded mandate onto our states who are already try trying to figure out how they're going to deal with their fiscal problems. It will cause the cost of health insurance to go up for 30% of all Americans immediately, and for the 70% who are in the large groups who get their insurance from large companies, they'll basically see no significant savings and ultimately more taxes. So the bottom line is we aren't going to see an increase in the ability to control or handle the cost of health care. We are going to see an increase in government, an increase in government controls, an increase in taxes, and a reduction in the stability of our Medicare programs. That's not the way we should approach reform. The Gregg Amendment simply says, let's create a lockbox, if you will, for Medicare, the same kind of lockbox that we need for Social Security to keep the Congress from continuing to raid Social Security, and let's put it into place to assure that all of these great statements that we hear on the floor about how we want to protect and preserve Medicare are enforced. It's simply creates by power of law, by force of law, the necessary mechanism to help all of us be sure what we're talking about here on the floor actually happens, namely that we protect Medicare from being raided to, for the establishment of yet again another massive federal entitlement program. With that, Madam President, I yield back my time.